Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Well, when I'm done, you might not want to sell those. I don't know. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I thank Pastor Tim for giving me a chance to come. Most of you may know me from giving the last few Gideon reports uh, that, that, that's been here. Um, but unfortunately, uh, I'm no longer part of the Gideons. It wasn't anything that they did. They're a wonderful organization. Uh, as I explained in Sunday school, I felt like I was in a crossroads where God was tearing me in two different directions. And I, I had to faithfully pray about where he wanted me to go. And I felt like he wanted me to continue my studies online and, uh, and, and, and complete those courses. And I just felt like being part of the Gideons was kind of tearing me away from that. You know, having a small family, you know, I don't have very much extra time, as you can imagine. So when you don't have very much extra time and then you're trying to participate in a couple different ministries, it makes it really difficult. And, and I felt like I wasn't able to give to both ministries the way I should. And, and I felt like God was calling me to continue to stay in the youth ministry at my church and to continue my studies. So um, Pastor Tim was a, a, a big part of that. Um, when I first started speaking, I remember my first couple sermons that I did at my church. Um, I can, the way we did it is we did each chapter verse by verse, and there were some verses I come, and Chuck explained this in Sunday school, I'm like him, sometimes I read a verse, and I'm like, what? I don't know what that means. And I would call Pastor Tim, and I'd say, could you please explain this to me? Tell me what your thoughts are on this verse. And he helped me a great deal when it came to that. Um, so uh, before I get started, I'd like to pray, and, and, and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this wonderful day that you provided. I thank you for each and every person that came to church today, Lord. Lord, I just pray that, um, that they don't hear any words from me today, that they only hear from you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you speak through me. I pray that you guide my thoughts and my actions, Lord. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. So my question to you, and it's funny because when I, when I started writing this sermon, um, as I started writing and I got almost all the way done, I thought, well, let me see if they're recording sermons now at, at, at the church here. And sure enough, you get on Facebook and you see some sermons. And, and, and kind, of, kind of a funny side note, it seems like every still image for every sermon that Pastor Tim preaches, he's like this. So I, I don't know if I can work that into my sermon, but I'll try to get emphatic and do that. But, um, but I just noticed, because the last time I was here, and I, I spoke on a Sunday night, I spoke on um, evangelizing, okay? And, and we kind of went in depth a little bit more. But my question to you today is, why did you come to church? Think about that. I, I don't need any answers. I just want you to just think about why you woke up this morning and you decided to get dressed and come to church. What was your reason to come here? Okay. So, and, and as, as I started studying, and I found a couple stories here and, and a couple funny stories I want to share with you. There's a story of three preachers who got together for coffee one day and found out that all of them faced the same problem with a bat infestation in their church buildings. One of them said, I got mad, I took a shotgun and fired at them. I missed the bats and put a hole in my roof. I don't suggest that approach. The second one said, I caught the bats in a trap and drove them 50 miles away and released them. Uh, unfortunately, they beat me back to the church building. <laughs> the third one said, I solved the bat problem I simply baptized them and made them deacons. I haven't seen them since. <laughs> it's kind of a story it's meant to be a little bit funny, but, but how real is it? it, is it? Another Sunday morning, two men were fishing and pretty uh, guilty for skipping church, especially since the fish weren't biting. One said to the other, I guess I should have stayed home and gone to church. The other man replied, maybe so, but I couldn't have gone to church anyways. My wife is sick in bed. So think about that. So I asked you why you came to church. 
There's a pastor friend of mine that we just went to the wilds together down in North Carolina. And he said to himself, he told a story and he said, you know what? He said, there was a guy that I know that was canvassing the area uh, uh, around his church. And he'd come up to me and he said, man, you must have a large congregation. He says, why are you saying that? He said, because almost every door I knocked on and I asked them, they said that they go to your church. They're a member of your church. Well, I can tell you, unfortunately, I've been to his church and it's not a large congregation. How many people out there may call this church home their church, but yet they're not here? They're just not here. Um, so um, what would the attendance be here today if everyone called this their home church? I, I just wonder, okay? Um, there's been one church... Uh, there has not been one church that all the members show up regularly. There's a lot of churches. I remember uh, and, and when I was a member of the Free Methodist Church, it was, a, it was a big thing there because you had to pay a certain amount of money to the, to the organization for the members that you have in your church. And actually, it was really difficult to try to sit down and figure out when you should take somebody off that church roll and when you shouldn't. And that's sad because... If they call this their church home, why are they not here? Um, now, I'm not saying that there are not legitimate reasons for not being at church. Uh, Clyde has, has shared, you know, he, he got the privilege of getting to go on a cruise. You know, sometimes we need some, some vacation time, some downtime in a way. And Pastor Tim, you know, needed some vacation time, right? Spend some time with family. But there's so many things out there that you could look at and say, well, that is a, a legitimate reason to not be here. One could be illness. How many people do you, can you recall in your head that are not here because of illness? We prayed for a few of them this morning. Okay. Um, <clears throat> travel could be another one. Family complications or work could be a, 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 an issue why you're not here. Okay, so with that being said, there, there are definitely uh, reasons why you can miss church, but the problem is, is many people, many people miss for a lot other reasons. Many people say they're committed to this church, but yet they only come on Sunday mornings, if even that. Now, the way I wanted to kind of tackle this is first I want to go to Exodus. So if you want to turn with me, I'm going to, I'm going to be in Exodus 25. We're just going to read a couple verses there. What I want to kind of get through you, to you first is the Old Testament church. What was the Old Testament church? What were they doing in the Old Testament church? And I don't want to spend a lot of time there, but we'll just kind of go through there and read a couple verses and... Starting in verse 8 of Exodus 25, it says, And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them, according to all that I shew thee. After the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. See, I think when you read those verses, you can really understand very quickly, in my opinion, on why there was an Old Testament church. God says it right there in the first verse, that I may dwell among them. <clears throat> okay? So, so right there, we can already see that the reason why the, the, the Old Testament church was gone was so, so God could dwell among them. Okay? So um, I think that that also shows that God had compassion for his people. He had compassion for them. See, they weren't seeking God, but yet God was still seeking them. Okay? God still wanted to dwell among them. Okay? Remember, if you look further back in Genesis, what was going on with Adam and Eve? God was seeking to dwell with them too, wasn't he? Okay? 
Uh, uh, how about when he revealed himself to Moses in the form of the burning bush? Okay, how about when the Israelites were delivered out of Egypt? How were they delivered? They were delivered by that pillar of cloud and the fire, weren't they? Okay, God was wanting, he had that desire for them and he also had compassion for them. See, I'm in the midst of renovating my house, a big renovation, okay? Uh, we, we took a, a empty room and we made it a kitchen so then we could turn the kitchen into another room. So you can imagine it's a big renovation, okay? And, and in the midst of those renovations, uh, obviously trying to pick out what kind of backsplash you want, what kind of cabinets you want, what kind of <coughs> sink you want, faucets, I mean handles for the cabinets. You can imagine there's all kinds of things and my wife has an opinion on all of them. And I, and I tell her all the time that you pick it, I'll install it. I don't care what it looks like, if whatever you, if you want handles that look like this, or you want cabinets that do this, or you want, listen, you pick it, and as long as we can afford it, I'll install it. See, back in, back in these times, if you read in Exodus a little bit later, you'll find out that God gave the Israelites specific instructions on how to build their tabernacle. He told them exactly the sizes, everything he wanted inside of it. He gave them specific instructions, okay? So um, he, Moses didn't have to sit down and, and, and discuss with anybody on what, what the tabernacle should look like. God gave them specific instructions on what that should look like. In Leviticus chapters 1 through 5, God explained how his people should meet him and all the offerings they should do. So you can go back and you can look at Leviticus and you can see what, now that the tabernacle was built, what God wanted them to do once they came to the tabernacle now. And all the, all the different offerings that he wanted them to do. Okay? He wanted them to do burnt offerings and sin offerings and, and other kinds of offerings he wanted them to do. Okay? The tabernacle became a place for them to deal with their sin. It was a place also to meet God. Okay? So I did watch a few of the messages from here from the last few weeks. And I did see uh, a, a, a dear friend of mine, Jack, when he came here a few weeks ago. Uh, what, a, what a great godly man. I, I, I wish I could have been here too. Uh, I love to hear him speak. I, 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 it's just, he's an amazing guy. But he said to, in his message that uh, the need to come to church with an expectation to meet God. So when I asked you at the beginning of this message, why did you come to church? Hopefully one of your reasons were you had an expectation to meet God. You had an expectation to worship God. I hope you took that message and that statement to heart. Now, let's look briefly at the New Testament church. So let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 18. Alright, it says, For through, through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and with the household of God. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets of Jesus Christ himself, being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, uh, all the building framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, 
in whom ye also are built, built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. See, I feel like Paul, in his words here, he, he explains to us very simply, and, and you guys probably all heard this before, that the church is not the building. Who's the church? The people. The people are the church. Okay? And, and Paul clearly explains that to us here in Ephesians. He lets us know. And, and, and as we did our responsive reading today, did you notice how it talked about being the children of God? All right. Um, so we have to remember that the church is, we are the church. See, it says in here, people who didn't know each other are no longer strangers, but related to each other through Christ's blood. See, the church is really made up of people that have a relationship with God not the building amen amen, amen. all right um so see i feel that the church is a body of believers that come together for the purpose of the great commission hopefully you guys all know what the great commission is great commission go ye into the world and preach the gospel unto every creature see when i asked you at the beginning why did you come to church I'm sure that if I had you guys raise your hands and give me kind of responses, you might have several different reasons why you feel like you came to church. But let me ask you, let me go over a few things uh, that you might not think of, but could be a wrong reason why you may have came to church today. First, people come to church on a Sunday because it ends up being like a ritual to them. They wake up every Sunday morning and they think, oh, it's Sunday, I gotta go to church. They weren't looking forward to it all the way through the week. They weren't looking forward to being in the house of God. They weren't looking forward to being amongst fellow believers. It just became a ritual. And if you look in a dictionary, a ritual is described as a formal ceremony or series of acts that's always performed in the same way. Now, although you sing different songs and different things like that, for the most part, the order of your service is the same way, right? It's, it, you, and you get used to it. If we came up here and I started preaching as soon as you walked in the door and then we sang the hymns, you would be looking like, what are we doing? That's not the way we do things here. Because you're used to a certain way. See... Sunday sometimes can become just something we do. We go to church on Sunday. It just becomes a ritual. You're really not invested in it in any way when you wake up and you come to church. You think it's just something you just have to do. You know, and, and, and we don't want to fall into that trap. Okay? Maybe you're coming to church uh, because your parents taught you that you should be coming to church but where's that personal relationship you have with God and those personal reasons that you have for wanting to come to church how about this another reason why people say they're coming to church is to get fed right I've heard that over and over and over ah, I want to go to church I, I, I need to get fed okay well let me ask you this. Um, I think that that's probably one of the most common excuses I hear about people leaving a church or going to another church. They'll look at me and say, well, I'm going to another church. I just wasn't getting fed there. I wasn't getting fed. Okay? But if you really, if they were really honest, okay, they're looking for another church that they like better. That's really what it, what it all boils down to. I, I know a lot of times for me, when I've come and, and I've left church, and I thought to myself, was I really even ready to hear the word of God today? 
Was my heart and mind open and clear and ready for God to show me something when I came to service today? Or did I just walk into the doors and when I go to my church, I have, I have a million things I got to do. I'm in the sound booth, so I got to get things ready for there. I deal with the online stuff. I, I got to get that ready. I got to turn all the projectors on, all the speakers on. I got lots of things to do. So sometimes I have to protect myself from coming in and just going through the motions. Just coming in and just doing what I do every week. And, and I have to make sure that I, I, I don't, um, I don't, I have a hard heart when I come and not ready to receive God's word. See, when you have that attitude about I'm not getting fed, a lot of times that comes from a deep rooted thing about a, a, a me, 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 me attitude. It's all about me. What can I get? What do I like about the service? What do I like about the songs? What do I like about the preaching? What do I? I, 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 I. Everything is about I. And John 4.34, if you want to write it down, and you don't have to turn real quick because we're going to try to go through it quick. It says, Jesus say, uh, saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. See, Jesus' spiritual food was not to sit by passively. He wasn't sitting there expecting to get fed. It was to, it was to do the will of God, to roll up his sleeves and finish the work that God has sent him to do. See, I'm not saying here that you need to go not come to church not wanting to learn. I'm, I'm not advocating that at all. You should, you should come to church and want to learn. You should want to hear what God has placed on Brother Tim's heart to share with you. Okay? Um, but the thing is, I have to watch out for is not, not learning all week long. See, when, when people are so focused on getting fed here on a Sunday morning... If you really look back on their lives and think of and see how much they're actually getting fed during the week, how much they're giving God time during the week, you would probably be surprised. Or maybe you wouldn't. Maybe you maybe you already understood when they're saying stuff like that, that they're really not working at it during the week. See I, if I asked to show of hands on how many of you opened and read or the big word studied scripture during the week and you were really honest how many of you in here would be raising your hand I know there's weeks that go by sometimes and I think to myself man I did not study the word of God like I should be I know that when, when, when we just went to camp and the guy stands up there and he talks about, he, the evangelist stood up there and he talked about, he said he wakes up in the morning and he reads the word of God for two hours every day before he start his, starts his day. Are you able to dedicate two hours of your morning before you even start and study in the word of God? I already feel like sometimes I'm like, God, I can't do that. I already get up too early in the morning, you know, but he challenged those teenagers. What about starting out at five minutes from the word of God? Wake up and read your Bible at least for five minutes. Here's what I can tell you. You start reading your Bible for five minutes. It's not going to take very long that you're going to start to yearn for more than five minutes. That you'll start reading and you'll realize, wow, I passed five minutes a long time ago. God will, God will just continue to bless you in that. But you have to start somewhere if you're not already. See, I've already explained to you when I first come up here how much I respect Pastor Tim. I respect him. I know you could just tell when you talk to him 
how much knowledge he has of the Bible. He has exceptional knowledge of the Bible. Here's what I can tell you, folks. He didn't get that knowledge overnight. He got that knowledge over time. Time that he's dedicated to spending time in God's Word. So we can look at somebody like that and we can say to ourselves, wow, that's impressive. Maybe that gives you something to strive for. Man, I, I would really like to know the Word of God better than I do right now. Okay? See, I think the, the another trap that we fall into is we rely on the pastor so much uh, because they know the Bible so well. Then the problem happens is, is if the pastor ends up leaving and you get another pastor and he's not the same way. Then pretty soon you're in a rut. You're like, wait a second, this isn't like what I'm used to. Or he goes on vacation and let some big ugly guy come up and fill in for him. And now I'm not talking about Jack. I don't want to. But, but all kidding aside, sometimes I, I don't know if you fall into that trap, but we could fall into that trap of relying on our pastor so much. I'm not saying you can't call and ask him questions. I'm not saying that he can't teach you stuff. He, could teach, he teaches me a lot. And I don't even come to this church and he teaches me a lot. What can you learn from him? But just don't rely on him alone. See, if you read the Bible, you, you'll quickly find out that the Bible tells us that if we lack wisdom, ask for it, and he'll provide it. God is faithful. God will provide the wisdom if we don't have it. And all we got to do is ask for it. We got to search for it. We got to get into the word. So think about that. I, I found this also online that I really liked this and I thought that it was very, very applicable, especially when I talked to Clyde today. The way many of us approach church is like a cruise ship. Okay, when you walk on board a cruise ship, you expect to be entertained, you expect good food, you expect good service, you expect leisure, and if you don't get that, then the service is bad. If the entertainment is not entertaining enough, you'll go find another cruise ship. Now, how many people are out there, or maybe it's you in here today, that are treating church like a cruise ship? That if you don't, if it doesn't go the way you want it to go, if, if, if it doesn't sound the way you want to go or or what whatever the case may be that that you're unhappy and then you may start looking for another cruise ship but i think it's better metaphor is like to approach church like a battleship when you walk on board the expectation isn't to sit but to serve you realize you're part of a greater mission and your mindset is to find a way to contribute however you can is this church your cruise ship or is this church your battleship are you looking to serve when you come into this church or are you looking to be entertained that's some tough questions now let me go into another reason why you shouldn't come to church i know that's kind of weird to say huh first the next thing you should you should be coming to, or I'm sorry, now is a why a reasons why you should come to church. Okay, the first reason you should come to church is to serve others, just like we heard in that battleship story. See, you have to get out of that mindset that it's not about me, it's about you. See, when God gives, God gave my son a talent to play guitar and sing, my older son, and. and if any of you heard in here, I know I'm probably biased, but I think he's exceptional. He's great at it. He's very, very good at it. Matter of fact, every time he comes home from college or from uh, Bible camp that he's been at for the last 12 weeks, as soon as he comes home, I'm like, are you going to sing in church this week? Are you going to sing in church? I'm excited for him to do that. But see, God didn't give him that talent for himself. 
He gave that talent to him for everybody else, for him to share that talent, not just to keep it to himself. See, when I saw Betsy over here playing piano, I think she did a wonderful job, great job. And I know it's big shoes to fill because I've heard Pastor Tim play, and I know he can tickle them ivories with the best of them. He's very, very good. But listen, Betsy's very good too. She did a wonderful job. I, I, there's no way I, I have not one musical bone on my body. I can't sing a tune. I can't play a lick. Nothing. There, there's nothing musically I can do. Matter of fact, you probably see me sit down, and if you see me sit down in the church, you probably want to sit a few pews away so you don't hear me because I'm bad. Okay? But you know what? I don't care. I'm going to sing anyways. I'm going to sing and I'm going to praise my God anyways. So are you coming to church to serve others? See, there's so much greater joy you can get in serving than seeking to be served. That's a powerful statement in my opinion. When you think about that, how much joy you get. You, you know the old adage about giving the gifts at Christmas time is better to give than to receive. It's better to serve than to be served. It's, so, it's such, such a joy to get to serve. See, uh, you can also attend church to encourage others or even your pastor. See, when I encounter some person in church, I have the opportunity to encourage them in person. See, one time I talked to somebody from that came to our church, and they gave me what I feel like is one of the greatest compliments you can get from somebody when they uh, attend your church as a visitor. They told me that as soon as they walked in, they felt loved. They felt God's love as soon as they walked into our church. They felt it from the people that come up and greeted them, they felt it the whole way. What a great compliment. Because that love can only come from God. That's no, that, that's not trying to put any person in our church up on a pedestal. That's saying that, that some of the people in our church are willing to show people God's love and be obedient to God. They're serving in that way. Maybe that's a way you can serve. Maybe you can think. And you think to yourself, well, what can I do? I'm, I, I'm too old to do this. Or I'm too, I, I, I don't know enough about the Bible to teach Sunday school or something, which is a common misconception. Uh, I don't know what to do. Maybe you could come to church early next week and stand in the back of that sanctuary when people walk in, shake their hand, give them a hug, and tell them that God loves them. You could serve. And, and the way that you can encourage others, you can also encourage your pastor. See, when I talked about the story about feeling God's love, I'm not saying that you couldn't, but what do you think about over YouTube or Facebook? That's what we do in our church, we Facebook Live. So is it not gonna be awful hard to show God's love to somebody personally? When they're watching it on Facebook, I'm not saying that's not a great thing because guess what? When I miss church, I watch my service every time. Every time. If I'm on vacation, even if I went to another church, even if I go and preach in another church, I will watch my service in my home church at some point in the near future. So I'm not saying that that's not a good thing because I think it's a great thing. You can reach way more people than you can by just opening your doors right here, by broadcasting it over the internet. And I'm sure we got millions and millions of people watching me right now, right? Is that, no? Okay. All right, that was a thought. All right? No, I didn't so I, I just want you to know, not only can you encourage others, but you can encourage your pastor also. I can tell you right now that, that as being somebody that's prepared messages, that's prepared lessons, okay, 
when nobody shows up, it's a very big discouragement. I remember uh, God put me in, the, in, the, in charge of the youth a long time ago not in my church when I first started going there. Okay, and I felt I filled the void there. And I remember as we were having Sunday evening services for the youth and we were meeting downstairs and I would prepare my lesson and I'd be ready to preach or be ready to speak or teach a lesson. And the only people to show up were my two kids and one other kid. See, I remember when it was like that. And I remember the discouragement I felt. And I remember the feeling that I had of saying, why am I doing this, God? I'm just doing this just for my kids. I could do this at home. But God kept, kept going. And he kept going. And he kept working. And he kept working. Now, I had the opportunity for about the third year in a row to take almost 30 teenagers to Bible camp for the week. 30 teenagers. What? And it's nothing that I did. Trust me. I'm not smart enough to do it. It's God. It's God. So you can encourage Pastor Tim by coming to church. By waking up in the morning and when you start wrestling with the, ah, oh, man, I, I would really like to sleep in. Or, man, I got so many things I need to get done. I, I, I need to do this or that. I, I, listen, I can tell you right now, I guarantee, not to call anybody out, but I know Charlie probably has a million things he needs to get done at the golf course right now. A million things. There's, he, he doesn't have a hundred people working for him out there. So I'm sure that if he showed up right now, there would be something for him to do. Right, Charlie? Yes, sir. There'd be something for him to do. But yet, he made it a priority to come here to church this morning. But yet, when we talk about coming to church, most people think that it's just Sunday morning. What about Wednesdays? How many of you are coming on Wednesdays? How about tonight when I go through a song verse by verse by verse? Am I going to see the same crowd? Am I going to see more or am I going to see less? See, I'm not trying to, if I'm stepping on your toes, I apologize because I'm really trying to step on your whole foot. And that's just being honest. Thank you. Because, listen, you should, you should yearn for God. You should want him so bad that every time they open these doors, you want to be here. You want to learn. You want to use it as an evangelistic tool. You want to invite people. You want to use this church and, and, and be here every time it opens. But yet we get so busy in our lives. And I, and I explained this in Sunday school to Chuck. I said, you know what? I've done this well in my life with my kids, and I've, I've missed the mark quite a few times with my kids. I, I would tell my kids that it doesn't matter what sport it is, if they play on Sunday, forget about it. And I remember my middle son, Dean, well, he's not like that, he's like this now, okay? My middle son, Dean, wanted to play peewee football. And you know what? I told him no. Out of the question. You can't even start because they play on Sundays. But you know what? There was times when he was growing up that, that he was in a baseball team and we're so excited because he got voted on the all-star team. We're so excited. But guess what? Every all-star team, when you know when they play tournaments? On the weekends, which includes Sunday. Guess where I was not at? I didn't make it. I, I, I thought I was doing a really good job, but yet I missed the mark. I missed the mark. So you can encourage your pastor. See, sometimes we get in that, in that thing where we think to ourselves, listen, he know, Pastor Tim, is, this is his job. So in closing here, because I know we're running late, I apologize for that, but I always run late. So I could be like Jack and ask you for five more minutes, okay? Um, so 
The last thing I want you to know is you can attend church because it's a great tool for evangelizing. You can invite people, okay? Um, I remember one time when I was in, in my, my free, at the Free Methodist Church and I was sitting there and, and attendance was dwindling and I was looking up to God and saying, God, man, the pastor's not doing a very good job here. The attendance is terrible. And I remember God revealing to me real vividly, listen, it's your fault. When's the last time you invited somebody to church? See, a lot of us want to blame the pastor for the lack of attendance in church. But if you really sat down and think about it, how many times have you invited people to church? I know we talked about that in Sunday school. And I, Donna, I think it is, Donna said that she, she has been actively inviting somebody and hoping that they'll show up. Listen, put that on your prayer list, guys. Pray for that. Pray that, that anybody in here that's inviting people to church, they will come. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> when I close here, I encourage you to do a self-reflection on why you're coming to church. Why are you coming? And is it all about you? Now, as I pray here, I do invite you to come back tonight at 7 o'clock as we go through one of the Psalms verse by verse and try to see what God has laid out for us. And I, I, I pray that, that you will make time to be able to come. And I, I thank you so much for hearing. Thank you for listening. And let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much uh, for, for the message that you've laid upon my heart to bring here today. I thank you for the willingness for Pastor Colvin to give me a call and ask me to come and fill the pulpit. It's such a privilege and honor to be able to be here and, and be in front of these people sharing your gospel, Lord. Lord, I thank you so much for each and every person that came here today. Lord, I pray that you impress it upon their hearts on why they came to church today, why they came to church last week, or why they'll come to church next week. I pray that, that they, maybe that they have a new view on why they should be here at church. Lord, I pray that if it's all about them, that you reveal that to them and let them know that the best way to go about this is to serve others. And Lord, if they're not already serving others here, that you give them a way. Show them a way that they can serve others. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We ask forgiveness for all of our sins. We pray this in Lord's blessed and holy name. Amen. Amen. Turn to page five.